6.30, it's our time to begin. If you're here in the morning, welcome back. If you're joining us here tonight, it's, we are glad to have you here. It's Sunday, the Lord's Day, day when we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember that we are serving risen Savior Jesus Christ and that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available now to work in our lives. Isn't that great? God is giving that power to us. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll open up with a, a word of prayer, uh, latest updates. We, uh, did anyone have a chance to visit Mr. Wesley? Yeah. Did? All right, give us some updates, man. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to pray uh, for Mr. Wesley Rowe and for the Rowe family. And then for uh, Miss Pat Hutchison, right? She also moved. She's not in intense care. She moved to her own room. And Mary just told me tonight that she talked to Tim. And Tim said she's walking now. She's out of bed and she's able to walk in the room, which is great praise. It was just a Wednesday when she had open heart surgery. It was life-threatening. But now she's walking in the room and can move forward. That's a great, great blessing. And, and thank the Lord for answering the prayers. Anything else we can bring to the Lord in prayer tonight? Any personal request or anything somebody would like to share for us to pray? All right, let me just uh, ask the Lord to bless our fellowship tonight that we will have. Brother Fred Logos, would you please lead us in a time of prayer? Father, we're thankful that we can come to you. We're thankful that our God hears our prayers and is able to do his will for us. And so we pray that in your will that Christ will be glorified tonight. We know you we know your word is we're faithful to your word. We pray that you'd be with Pastor Dario as he teaches from your word tonight. We pray that we would make it effective in our lives. We're thankful for the uh, Good news from um, Pat Hutchinson that she's able to even get up today. We thank you for that. And thank you for uh, bringing her back to uh, the situation and position that she's in right now. And we ask for your continued healing and blessing to her body and, and help her family at this time, give them strength and, as they travel and such and, and provide for every need they might have. And then for Wesley, uh, we're so thankful to hear that they know what they need to try to fix. And so we pray that uh, you give the doctors wisdom as they begin to regulate his um, heart, that it will <coughs> calm down and that he will uh, find the, the, whatever the cause of that might be. And we know he's in a good hospital and in good hands. We pray your blessing <coughs> upon those doctors as they make decisions regarding his health. And again, we're thankful that uh, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life in place of ours. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Fred. Every Sunday night we have different people who are leading us into time of worship with spiritual songs. Tonight we have a privilege of blessing to have Jacob Nash here with us. He's very... Uh, a gifted musician, but also very nervous because his mom is sitting right over there. So uh, <laughs> oh, that was a joke, you know. <laughs> I forgot to mention to pray for him, you know. Also, but no, Jacob is here with us. He's not nervous. He's he's ready, ready to lead us in the time of prayer. Jacob, please, brother, come here and lead us into time of worship with spiritual songs. Hello. Bear with me. 
takes time. Not five seventy nine. Oh, shine, Jesus, shine. Yeah, we're gonna get to that one. It's about, I think, the third song. I'll fly. We got. I'll fly away, and I saw the light, and I can't find those in that hymnal. You would think they'd be in there, but they're not. All right. Uh, great is thy faithfulness, but it's just. A little intro. Great is that faithfulness? Fifty four. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. life have gone, I'll fly away, like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah. By and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days, and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away.
wonder so aimless yes life filled with sin I wouldn't let my dear Savior in then Jesus came like a stranger in the night praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light no more in darkness and no more at night now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears, I cling for my own. Then like a blind man, no God gave me sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness and no more at night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness and no more at night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. This next one's kind of difficult. I was flipping through the hymn, trying to figure out an old school one that I liked, and it's not that old, but I remember singing it in Selma Baptist. It's real wordy, though, so I'm probably going to mess up 50 times. Uh, shine, Jesus, shine, for those who can find it in the hymnal. Five something. your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining Jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth and bring us shine on me shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light Lord I come to the awesome presence from the shadows in your radiance by the blood I may enter your Search my try me soon darkness shine on me shine on me shine Jesus shine fill this land with the Father's glory blaze spirit blaze set our hearts on 
fire flow river flow flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your words lord and let there be light lord we've done the second verse yet Lord, I come to your awesome presence from a shadows into your radiance. Blood, I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume the darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your words, Lord, and let there be light. Third verse. I think we did the second twice. As a gaze of your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness. Ever change and your glory. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire, flow flow flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be light probably should have practiced that one a little bit more before we jumped on that it's all right though all right we got another one one more that i wrote and jennifer's gonna sing harmonies on this one with me So, this song's called Solid Ground. Um, it's bluegrassy, and really, God just kind of hit me with it. It just stages in my life going through um, not knowing what I was going to do with my life. Uh, you go and when you're walking in the desert, sin in life, you can't go through it, and you need God, and, you know that whole type thing. But um, you'll we'll just sing it. You'll get it. I learned to love the little things in life wrongs that you made right I stand my ground when I forsake those little things I get lost in desert dreams in life and they pull me down and you call me back to solid ground when you call when you call, you call right on that old dry desert would have pulled me down in time when you call you call right on time that old dry desert would have pulled me down in time that old dry desert would have pulled me down in time
many years I walked the desert sands Searching for a plan On how to live my life For many years you carried me While I chose to live in misery I was lost I knew where to be found So I followed you to solid ground When you call, when you call, you call right on time. That old dry desert would have pulled me down in time. When you call, when you call, you call right on time. That old dry desert would have pulled me down in time. That old dry desert would have pulled me down in time. The other side keeps a constant hand on me, pulling at my feet to chase a desert dream. But you gave me joy on solid ground. If I fall, I surely won't fall down, for in you I'm found. Now I know. Five, verses 3 through 12. The Beatitudes are Jesus' declarations of blessedness. They give us eight character qualities, and Jesus calls those who live out those character qualities blessed because God has special blessings in store for them. As you see this picture, we are using this illustration. Pastor Colin Smith is using this illustration in his sermon series on the Beatitudes, and it really explains the progression that is happening in the Beatitudes. When we imagine the child swinging from one monkey ring to the next one, uh, you remember the key to swinging on monkey rings is momentum. The momentum of your swing on the first ring makes it possible for you to reach the second ring. The momentum of your swing on the second ring makes it possible for you to reach the th third ring, and so on. And the Beatitudes are like a series of rings. You reach the next one with the momentum you have gained from the previous one. There is that progression where each one leads to the next one and each one comes from the previous one. Each successive Beatitude shows a slightly higher level of spiritual maturity. The Beatitudes also, when we think about it in this way tonight, they challenge the way we live each day. 
Now, each beatitude is almost direct contradiction, contradiction of society's typical way of life. Now, think about it for a moment. The first beatitude, so far we have seen uh, that God blesses those who are poor in spirit. The first beatitude is blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Poverty of spirit means to depend upon God for everything. And at the heart of this character trait is humility. The opposite attitude is pride and personal independence, something that our society values very much. Then God also blesses when his disciples mourn over, their, over the sin in their own lives and also over the effects of the sin in this world. And at the heart of this character trait is sensitivity, another character trait very uh, needed today because our society puts focus on happiness at all costs. And then we just move sensitivity completely out of our life. God also blesses those who are meek. And we saw that meekness is the ability to be self-controlled and submissive to God. And this term describes those who are calm and peaceful under a heated atmosphere, in a heated situation. Describes those whose carefully chosen words can suit strong emotions. Describes an individual whose, whose tact and graciousness can provide at the same time and cause others to retain their self-esteem and their dignity. A meek person is also the one who can lead without overpowering others. You know, the way, and that way of life contradicts the way how society, how people in our world usually live. A strong person in our world is, is measured by, by authority and by domination that uh, one person holds over, over others. The strong ones are those who can best bend the wills of others to conform to their own, to their own right? And then in the fourth Beatitudes, Jesus tells us that God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who desire to hear and do the will of God will be blessed from God with an unusual measure of personal contentment and satisfaction. God says they will be filled. They will receive that unusual measure of contentment and satisfaction from God. In the fifth Beatitude, Jesus tells us that God blesses those who are merciful. And merciful person, mercy is concern for people in need. Another thing that we need in our isolated, in our individualistic and cold society, mercy is rarely demonstrated. So we see that the Beatitude describes people who are blessed by God. But at the same time, Beatitude calls us to have commitment to values that those around us may not appreciate and may also resent and reject. Almost each by the attitude is direct contradiction of society's typical way of life. But Jesus calls us to live, to be different kind of people, to be holy people who live by different standards. And we are learning what God really blesses, to what God really gives approval. And tonight we are looking at the sixth beatitude that is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And Jesus says in the, fifth, in the sixth beatitude, blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And here Jesus promises something that each one of us desires. We all desire to see God. Ecclesiastic chapter 3, verse 11 says, God has planted eternity in every human heart. God has planted eternity in every human human heart. And the implication is that we can never find complete satisfaction with earthly pleasures and pursuits. We all have that desire for the perfect world. And that perfect world can only happen inside of God's perfect rule. So Jesus said that the privilege of seeing God is reserved for those with a pure heart. We all want to see God, but Jesus said those who have pure heart. To them, I will give a blessing of seeing God. And two questions immediately emerge that are both, uh, uh, des that both deserve answer. Question number one, what does it mean to be pure in heart? And question number two, what does it mean to see God? What does it mean to be pure in heart? And what does it mean to see God? Think about heart. First of all, let's think about heart. In biblical terms, the heart 
is the master control center of your life. The heart is the seat of personality. And the personality is the sum total of mind, emotions, and will. Mind refers to our intellect and our understanding. Emotions, or, or they refer to our feelings. The will refers to our decisions and commitment-making uh, process. And all three of these, summed up, make heart. So the heart is where thoughts, where desires, where sense of purpose, where will, understanding, and character reside. And that is why Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And Jesus often, during his earthly ministry, talk about heart. Let me just give you two quotes. Uh, in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. You remember this one. Where your treasure is, there your heart, oh, there will your heart also be. Then in chapter 12, in verses 33 to 35, Jesus says, Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So that's the saying that we probably heard many times. People say, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Full of. So the heart is the center of our being. The heart is the center of our being. And the sixth beatitude tells us that those who are blessed, those who enjoy a favorable position with God, are those who are pure in heart. But, Houston, we have a problem. right? Because the Bible tells us that the heart of man is anything but pure. And this is not just the problem of specific presidential candidates and specific presidents, it's the problem of all of us, right? The Bible tells us that our heart is anything but pure. It says, actually, the Bible says that the heart is naturally wicked. Remember Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Let's see this on PowerPoint. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And this verse tells us why we sin. It's the matter of the heart. Our heart is inclined towards sin from the time we are born. Our heart is so deceitful and so wicked that Jeremiah wondered, who can even understand? Who can understand heart? It's so deceitful. It's so naturally wicked. So that brings us to the next thing that we need to consider, the idea of purity. How can then heart become pure? We saw the heart is the center of our being, but heart is also naturally wicked. So let's consider the idea of purity. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about purity and heart that must be pure? Where scholars of biblical languages tell us that the Greek word translated pure in Matthew 5, 8, has two basic meanings, two basic meanings. Now, first, it means to be free from the contamination of sin. That's the first meaning, to be free from the contamination of sin. And the Greek word is kataros. Kataros, that sounds a little bit familiar to some English words. The kataros from which we get the English word catheter, right, the instrument for removing impurities from body. You know, when you have catheter, you put it on and you remove impurities from your body. So the idea is to be clean through the removal of contamination. You become clean through the removal of contamination. Now, think about pure water. Well, let's see this slide, pure water. Pure water, when you go in the store and you buy, you know, the water, the, you take the bottle and it's written pure water, right? So pure water, is water that has had all harmful, harmful elements removed by filtration, right? That's what pure water is. So it's the water that had all harmful elements removed by filtration. So being pure in heart means to be free from the contamination of sin, to be completely free from the contamination of sin. And this kind of purity will be 
a reality for believers once they are in heaven. You know, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, we see that when we see God face to face, we will be completely free from the sin nature and the sinful deeds that flow from it. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 3, 2 and 3, we read, But we know when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. He said, when we see Christ, we will be like him. When we see God face to face, we will be free from the sin nature and from all sin, sinful deeds that flow from our sin nature. We will be sinless, just like Christ. And that's what pure in heart means, one, one particular meaning. It means to be free from the contamination of sin. But that kind of purity will be reality for a believer only when we are in heaven, when we see God face to face. And that brings us to the second meaning of this word. And second, the word pure also means to have an undivided loyalty to God, to have an undivided loyalty to God. And God expects us to pursue that kind of purity now, while we still live on this earth. And we can see this idea in James chapter 4, verse 8. Please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 4 and look at verse, verse 8. In James chapter 4, verse 8, we read, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. All right, notice how James describes people who need to purify their hearts. He calls them double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Minded. Now, double-minded, that's the opposite of being single-minded, right? Double-minded people are, the, are people who, who desire two things at once. They don't desire only one thing, but they desire two things. And the impurity of double-mindedness is explained in chapter 4, verse 4. If you go back to James chapter 4, now look at verse 4. James says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. He said, you can be friend of this world and friend of God. You're either friend of God or you're friend of this world. You cannot be both. There is no way to be both. So a double-minded person, who is then a double-minded person? A double-minded person is someone who is not convinced that God's way is the best way. A double-minded person is someone who treats God's word like any other human advice. Sometimes I receive it, but sometimes I reject it. A double-minded person fluctuates between allegiance to subjective feelings, the world's ideas, and God's commands and principles. You have God's commands and principles, you have subjective feelings, and you have the world's ideas. A double-minded person will be the one who will fluctuate between these three worlds all the time, trying to take and rely on all three at the same time, from time to time. And James 1.8, again, if you go back in the book of James, you remember James 1.8, tells us that double-minded people are unstable in everything they do. It's a double-minded people, talks about prayer, that you need to pray in faith. If you don't pray in faith, you're like a, like a wave that is tossed by the wind, and he said, double-minded people are unstable in everything they do. So being pure in heart, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, means to have a single-minded devotion to God. You must have a single-minded devotion to God. It means to have no double allegiance. There can be no double allegiance. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talked on the subject of money, he also emphasized the importance of having single-minded devotion to God. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. No one can serve two masters. 
For you will hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. So that's the idea that, that comes over here when we talk about loyalty. The word pure means to have an undivided loyalty to God. If we go to the Old Testament, when we study the Old Testament and go to the passages that talks about the purity of heart, you will notice that all these passages that talks about the purity of heart is referring to being purified from idols. Now, what is an idol? An idol is any loyalty that replaces God at the center of your life. Any loyalty that replaces God at the center of your life. That is an idol. Now, Pastor Bruce Gotcha in his commentary on the Sixth Beatitude says this, the person with a pure heart is one who is getting rid of the idols in their lives. Practically speaking, being pure in heart means this. We resist the idol of secularism and draw our truth from the Bible. We resist the idols of sports, recreation, and other amusement and refuse to let these things replace our devotion to the Lord. We resist the idol of materialism by refusing to become indebted and instead we use our money in a way that honors the Lord. We resist the idol of busyness by refusing to be occupied with less important things in life while neglecting the more important things in life. We resist the idol of power by choosing to deal with each other with humility rather than with force. A person who is serious about getting free of sin is one who is passionately pursuing what is pure. They pursue a single-minded devotion that is constantly clearing out idols from our lives, end quote. So the sixth beatitude, if we connect all this together, the sixth beatitude calls us to, to personal honesty regarding our loyalty. The sixth beatitude also calls us to remove idols out of our lives. Remove all the idols that are in your life and think about your ultimate loyalty. So the sixth beatitude also calls us to pray as David prayed in Psalm 86, verse 11. Now look at on the PowerPoint this verse. It says, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Notice what David prayed for. He said to Lord, give me an undivided heart. And that's the prayer that we need to pray. That's the prayer that the sixth beatitude calls us to pray. Lord, give me an undivided heart, the heart that is only devoted to you, that there is no double allegiance in that heart. Give me an undivided heart. So to be pure in heart means to have an undivided loyalty to God. It means to have a single-minded devotion to God. And then Jesus promises that those who are pure in heart will see God. Which is a wonderful promise. But what does it mean to see God? What does it mean to see God? Now, the Bible highlights several truths that can help us as we answer this question. Number one, the Bible says that no one may see God in his essence. No one may see God in his essence. And many verses teach this truth. Now, in your outline, you will see under this point that there are several references. Let me just quickly quote them. Uh, for the sake of the time, John 1, 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. It says, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. So Paul says God lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. So no one has seen or can see. And then God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. No one may see me and live. So sinful man has never seen, nor can he ever see, God's full glory. That's what the Bible reveals. Sinful man 
has never seen, nor can he ever see God's full glory. Why? Because you only see what you are able to see. That's a short answer. You only see what you are able to see. And that's a fundamental principle uh, uh, of life on this earth. Now, let me use one illustration. You see the next slide over here. Uh, you go tonight and you will see stars up on the, on the sky in heaven, right? When I look at the stars, I see the stars and nothing else. Now, imagine the one who is an astronomer by occupation. An astronomer. Now, he can see the constellations, he can see the galaxies, he can see the orderly expanse of the universe, he can see all of that, right? Now, think about another thing is Chinese letters here. You know, when I look at Chinese writing, I can see only foreign images. But someone else, they can see a verse, they can see a poem, they can see a speech. By the way, try to guess. This is verse, one verse. What verse is this in Chinese? <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> because you're thinking with the picture. It has nothing to do with the picture. <laughs> Good guess, Viva, you see. I think we can elaborate, elaborate. What are we talking about tonight? Yeah, blessed are, it's, it's Matthew 5, 8. You know, blessed are pure in heart, for they, they shall see God. But y y you see the point. You know, we, you can only see what you are able to see. You can only see what you are able to see. And that explains, you know, because we are finite and, and morally imperfect, we cannot exist and see God as he is. So thus, seeing God does not mean seeing him in his essence, seeing him in his full glory. That's not the promise that Jesus gives here. No one, no one has ever seen, nor can he ever see God's full glory. That's what the Bible teaches. And then the second thing that the Bible highlights is this. The kind of people we are determines the kind of revelation we receive. The kind of people we are determines the kind of revelation we receive. I want you to see this in Psalm 18. Turn to Psalm 18, please. And look at verses 20 through 26. Psalm 18. Look at the verse, beginning from verse 20. David says, The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, I am not guilty of turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now notice verse 25. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure. But to the devious you show yourself true. So you notice in this passage... When you take this, David highlights that the kind of people we are determines the kind of revelation we receive, right? And this principle also explains why so many people in Jesus' day did not see the truth about Jesus. Think about it for a moment. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years, right? He repeatedly demonstrated with his words and with his actions that he is the savior of the world. But most people have missed his true identity. The kind of people we are determine the kind of revelation we receive. So when we live by God's standards, God will reveal himself to us. Now, turn with, to John chapter 14, 21, and notice what Jesus mentioned there in John 14, verse 21. John 14, 21, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever has my commands and obeys them or keeps them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. 
or to them. I know what Jesus said. He says that he saves the deepest revelations of himself for those who love him by obeying him. Now, for those who love me, I will reveal myself to them. For those who keep my commandments and those who love me, they will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So the kind of people we are determines the kind of revelation we receive. Right? And that brings us thirdly to third point. In this life, seeing God means to have a deep experience with God. What does it really mean to see God? In this life, while we are still here on this earth, to see God means to have a deep experience with God. And this truth is highlighted in Numbers chapter 12. When you go in Numbers chapter 12, we have a story where Aaron and Miriam criticize Moses' leadership. Now, Aaron and Miriam, they were, uh, Aaron was serving as a high priest. He was close associate to Moses. Miriam was serving in the role of a prophet. She was prophetess. And they... Uh, were, so to say, two most powerful groups next to Moses. Moses was the leader. You have the high priest. You have the, the uh, Miriam who was serving as a prophet. But they said in verse 2, if you go to uh, Numbers chapter 12, in verse 2, they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? They raised this question. Has the more Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? The Lord heard them. And immediately responding. And in his response, the Lord did not deny their role in his plan. He has a great value for them. He's using them. But the Lord clearly highlighted that his relationship with Moses is special. He highlighted that he has a special relationship with Moses. And God said in Numbers chapter 12 verse 8, With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now notice what God says to him. He says, with him I speak face to face. And God basically emphasizes here that Moses had the most intimate encounters with God. He said, up to this point, Moses was the one who had the most intimate encounters with God. God spoke to Moses without mediation. He did not speak to him through dreams and vision, he, speak, he spoke to him directly. Moses had a direct communication with God. You know, to others, God talked through dreams and vision, but God says here, no. With Moses, I speak directly. He is the one who has direct communication with me. So implication is, God said here, Moses, you know, he had the most intimate encounters with me. So seeing God means to have a deep experience with God. To have a deep experience with God, just like Moses, to have a deep experience with God. And this is what Jesus promises to you and to me if we maintain pure hearts. If we maintain our hearts pure, he promises that we will have deep experiences with him. And what a wonderful blessing that is. So being pure in heart means to have an undivided loyalty to God. It means to have a single-minded devotion to God. Now, but why is God alone worthy of our loyalty? That's what raises the question. Why is God alone worthy of our loyalty? Why would we be just loyal to him? Why have single-minded devotion just to the Lord? And there are four reasons. If you go, go to Exodus chapter 20, I want you to see something in Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, and look at verse 2. Verse 2 is the first commandment. Now, you remember the Ten Commandments. In the, the Ten Commandments, God gave the Ten Commandments to lead us to a life of practical moral purity. We can say it like this. So, here's the Ten Commandments given to us to lead us to a life of practical purity moral purity. And in the first commandment, which forms the basis of the Ten Commandments, God reveals himself to us. And then the next nine commandments, God gives instructions to all of us how we can relate to one another in loving and responsible manner. Right? And God says in the first commandment, Exodus chapter 20 verses 2 and 3, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. 
you shall have no other gods before me. Now that's the first commandment, and he gives revelation of who he really is. Now I want you to notice something. Uh, J. John, he is a British apologist, he, in his commentary on this, on this commandment, he says, God gives us here four reasons why he alone is worthy of our loyalty. Here are four reasons why he alone is worthy of our loyalty. And, and notice, and that's, that's highlighted with the terms that he is using in this, in this passage. He calls himself Lord, he calls himself God, he is talking your, to, to the people of Israel, I am your God, and he said, I am the one who took you out of the slavery, the one who is your redeemer. Now let's think about it for a moment. First, in, in this first commandment, God states that he is the Lord. He said, I am the Lord your God. And the title Lord that we have Lord in, in, in the Old Testament uh, uh, is translated as Yahweh. You remember when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and Moses said, you know, what is your name? What shall I say to the people of Israel? God said, I have chosen you to go and lead people of Israel out of Egypt. He said, what should I tell them? What's your name? How can I convince them that I am really the one who should do this type of mission? And God says, go and tell them I am who I am. And also tell them that Yahweh, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sent you to them. Right? He said, go tell them I am who I am and tell them that God of, Isaac, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have sent you to them. Now, I am who I am is, is where scholars have uh, a trouble to really clearly say what that really means, what's the really meaning of that. It's not easy to, to give the meaning of, of that name. But in the context when God says, just go and tell them I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, I am the one who sent you, I will be with you. God is implying, he said, go and convince them. Tell them you are the man who is supposed to take them out of the slavery, out of Egypt, to lead them to the promised land, and tell them, just as I revealed myself to Isaac, to Jacob, to, to, to Abraham, I'm going to reveal myself to them. They will see my presence. They will see me at work. So that's the idea. There is a God who wants to reveal himself. So the name Lord, and, and when God says, I am the Lord, he declares that he desires to reveal himself in such a way that we can come to know him. That's what our God wants. You know, our God is like, to use the illustration, he there are so many, if you read the Bible, so many verses that says, seek the Lord and you will find him. Our God loves to reveal himself. To use the illustration, you know, uh, kids. No matter what country of the world you go, all kids likes to play hide and seek. Now, but did you ever notice when little kids play hide and seek? What, what is the fun for them? They, they can go and they will, let's say, hide here behind the piano. And if you're looking for them, I know when I play with Dominic like that, and you're looking, where are you? Are you behind the chair? Are you, you know, behind over there? And the closer when you are coming to their hiding place, you can just hear them giggle and, you know, they're, they're kind of giggling at you. They're coming closer, you know, I say, are you maybe here behind the piano? And you will hear them giggle. And for them, for little kids, the joy is not in hiding. The joy is in being found, right? Once when you find them, they just burst in laughter and they're really excited. And that's the same with God. The joy for God is not in being hidden. It's in being found, once when you find him, he loves to reveal himself. And that's what the Lord says here. I am the Lord. I am the one who desires to reveal myself in such a way that you can come to know him. He is, our God is not an unknown mystery, right? He is God who reveals himself clearly in order that we might enter into relationship with him. That's our God. That's the God of the Bible. The God who loves to reveal himself clearly in order that we might enter into relationship with him. So he says, I am the Lord. Then he states, he, I am God. You know, I am the Lord, your God. He is God. And that name is basically the declaration that he is the creator and sustainer of everything. Right? You remember how the Bible begins. In the beginning... God created heavens and earth. There is that name, God. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. So God made everything, including us. And that means that our lives have purpose and design. And that also means, you know, that, that uh, uh, 
we can have confidence when we face any difficulty in life. You remember how God encouraged Job. The story of Job. Job finds himself in a dilemma that he could not understand. And he starts calling into question the nature and actions of God. And God patiently and lovingly responds to Job with questions about creation and preservation. You remember, he asked him all these different questions about, he said, look everything here in the nature. Look around you and see how I am faithfully providing for the beasts of the field. See how I'm faithfully providing for the birds in the air. How much more I will not provide for a man who is created in my image, who is the crown of my creation. And after this conversation that God and Job had, Job repented, right? And, and, and that understanding that God is our creator and that God is our sustainer, that gives us confidence to face any difficulty in our life. He knows us, our lives have purpose and design, he created us and he will sustain our lives. He will be with us no matter what we're going through. And then thirdly, he states, I am your God. Notice, I am the Lord, your God. And that, that phrase, your, talks about the bond. He talks to the people of Israel, the bond that already existed between God and the people of Israel, that covenant bond. I am your God, your God, the one who is in covenant with you. I am the most powerful God. I am sovereign God. I am God who who rules humanity, the God who rules history. And they already experienced what God did in the land of Egypt. God showed his power. He showed to everyone that he is the ultimate ruler of the universe. He is the ultimate controller of all history and all future. There is no one who has higher authority over him. People of Israel experienced God's superiority in Egypt. He said, I am your God, I am the one who rules humanity, I am the one who controls every situation in life. And then the fourthly, God says that he is the redeemer. He said, I am the one who provides deliverance from slavery. He said in, in second part of verse 2, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the one who took you out of the land of slavery. And think about it, in what situation people of Israel were in Egypt. They were demoralized, they were helpless, they were serving as slaves, discouraged, defeated, and to those kind of people, God came and he intervened on their behalf. He brought them out of bondage and he promised them a land that they could never achieve on their own. They could never even dream to have that kind of land. That's what God promised. Now, today, we have a, a much greater privilege than the people of Israel. They were delivered from the slavery of Egypt, but we are del uh, uh, delivered. They were de delivered, actually, basically out of Egypt, but we were literally delivered out from eternity in hell. We were all on the way to hell, and God delivered us out of that situation. He delivered us from the slavery of sin and certainty of spending eternity in hell. He is the Redeemer, the one who provides deliverance from slavery because he is a gracious God. So the first commandment calls us to have exclusive relationship with God, shows us why God alone is worthy of our undivided loyalty, why God alone is worthy of our loyalty. He is worthy of our loyalty because he is God the creator, he is God the Lord, he is God the King, and he is God the Redeemer. And God says, if I am truly at the center of your life, then you will see me working in a mighty ways in your life. And that's the promise of the six Beatitudes. If I am really at the center of your life, if you have single-minded devotion to me, I promise you will see me working in a mighty way in your life. And what a great promise that is. Amen. 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 May God bless these words in our hearts and may this be reality for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will bless these words in our hearts. Thank you for calling us tonight to be the people who, who will remove idols from their lives. Father, we just pray, show us. What is it in our life that we maybe unconsciously even make to be our, our, our idol, Father? 
show us is there any loyalty in our lives that replace you from the center of our lives. We want to be people, we want to be individuals who, who have a single-minded devotion to you, Father. People who don't live with double allegiance. We know we cannot serve more than you. We can serve only you. So help us to have that devotion, Father. We want to have pure hearts. We pray as David prayed in Psalm 86, 11. Oh God, give us undivided heart. That's our desire. We want to have just the heart that serves you because you are worthy of all our love and all our service. Amen.